Hello, I'm Gary Stearman. Today we're going to be talking about a book by L.A. Marzulli. It's called On the Trail of the Nephilim. This is exciting. Stay with us. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bob Ulrich, Gary Stearman's partner and the co-founder of Prophecy Watchers. I would love to tell you how you can become a subscriber to our wonderful Prophecy Magazine, creatively named The Prophecy Watcher. And ready for this? How you can get eight powerful Prophecy DVDs as a free bonus for subscribing today. Every day, the ancient prophecies of the Bible get more and more exciting as we watch world events come into perfect alignment with the words of the ancient prophets. Examine the pre-trib rapture doctrine taught by the Apostle Paul. Come to a deeper understanding of the giants of Genesis 6 and the real reason for the flood of Noah. Read the shocking things we see coming out of the world of science and technology, mind-blowing advances in transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Keep a close eye for a series of wars coming very soon to the Middle East. The Bible's a supernatural book, and we enjoy covering the fringe subjects and dark corners of Scripture as well. UFOs, the Nephilim, the miracles of the Bible, and so much more. It's a one-of-a-kind publication full of articles that will make you a Bible prophecy expert and prepare you for the future. We have a very special subscription offer for you today. For your gift of $50 or more to support the worldwide outreach of Prophecy Watchers, you can subscribe to either the digital version or the print version of our magazine. And here's the best part. In addition to receiving 12 monthly issues of the magazine, this offer comes with a fantastic bonus. Eight DVDs from some of the leading prophecy experts in the world today. Eight DVDs plus 12 issues of the magazine represents a $200 value. But it's available today for your gift of just $50 or more to support the work of Prophecy Watchers. This offer is available anywhere in the USA and will ship both the magazine and the DVDs absolutely free. Don't wait or hesitate. Call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of this limited time offer. Looking at the future through the lens of Bible prophecy is the entire focus of this ministry. We're motivated like never before by our desire to tell the world that Jesus is the only answer for these troubling times. And we do believe that he's coming back very soon, just as he promised. Partner with us today. Help us take God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ to the whole world. Well, L.A. Marzulli, it is a pleasure to welcome you back. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Gary. Thanks for having me back on. Now, you have been the very definition of busy over the past few months. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you let no grass grow under your feet, but you've been working on this book, which, by the way, is a, this book is amazing. Beautiful uh, clay coat, glossy stock, loaded with photographs. But it's the thesis of the book that blows me go. away because... I think you have come to a point in history that people really need to hear about. And having said that, let's talk about how you came to write the book on the trail of the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. it, it really, the, the whole book centers around the idea that there has been a deliberate cover-up of certain artifacts, skeletons, bones, um, not only in this century, but actually predating back into the 20th and to the latter part of the 19th century. And the reason for this is we have report after report after report, and we document those in the book mm -hmm. about as, as settlers in the Americas begin to push into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, all those areas, they see burial mounds, and they do these con conduct sort of these primitive archaeological digs in these burial mounds. Well, guess what? They're pulling out 9, 10, 11, even as tall as 12-footers, six fingers, double rows of teeth, reddish hair, copper ornaments. In my opinion, these are not Native Americans. They come from someplace else. Now, why can't we go to the museums and see these marvelous large-scale <laughs> skeletons? Well, again, it, it goes down, it, it comes down to this, that we are, academia and the scientific community runs under a Darwinian worldview, Darwinian paradigm. Everything is filtered through that, through Darwinism. And unfortunately, or I should say fortunately for us as Christians, these, these skeletons go against the Darwinian paradigm. It makes no sense. It means someone was over in this, in this part of the world well in advance of the Bering Strait in the last mm -hmm. ice age, what's called the Beringian 
um, um, evolution from people coming over um, on the Bering Land Strait into the Americas, it sort of blows that theory out of the water. It also um, is telltale in the sense that it's pointing to a race of people, or perhaps hybrid beings, which came from the old world. And this, the theory is, is as Joshua and Caleb pushed into the promised land, and we see all those different tribes, right. Nephilim tribes, Nephilim, Monachim, Rephaim, uh, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, all these Nephilim tribes, and I believe each one perhaps had maybe a different physical characteristic. So as Joshua and Caleb come in to the promised land, what we see, in my opinion, is this diaspora. The giants realize, the Nephilim tribes realize, the mandate has gone out to wipe them all off, men, women, children. And remember, these are demonic hybrid beings. They are Nephilim. Where no grace and mercy is shown by a loving, the same loving God in the Old Testament that we serve today. No difference. The judgment is severe. It's final. And the giants see this, know this, and I believe some of them fled northward. Others built boats, perhaps, and sailed across the Atlantic. The ones that went northward, of course, settled down in the Ohio Valley, where we see what I believe is Nephilim architecture. And the artifacts that were exhumed um, in, in the latter part of the 19th and into the 20th century, again, we have, and it's documented in the book, we have report after report, newspaper clipping after newspaper clipping, authenticating this. Now, in the book, you have a picture of an axe head, mm -hmm. uh, which found its way into a museum. This axe head is huge. 26 pounds. Uh, no human being that I know of today, uh, you know, a, a big, strong uh, six foot two guy, lumberjack, would have trouble with this axe head. It must have been used by somebody larger than a normal human being today. Much larger. And when we start looking at nine, 10, or 11 feet, all of a sudden this is no longer a ceremonial axe head as some of the archaeologists would have us believe. Right. But in fact, if, it, if the axe head was found next to an 11 footer, we're looking at an object was an object that was utilitarian for that particular person. And again, we document in the book, there are, um, there's one particular uh, skeleton that is exhumed, which is around 11 feet. And it talks about um, the, the ax heads and, and spearheads and, and bows and arrows that are also found with the skeleton, which begs the question immediately, well, what happened to it? It's all gone. Can't find it anywhere, no trace of it. And we, we, we read this in the accounts over and over again. Hmm. The Smithsonian Institute, with all due respect to them, they come in, they create up the artifacts, no one ever sees them again. And it's not just the Smithsonian. Uh, a lot of uh, anthropological exhibits have been, shall we say, censored. Yes. Uh, and we have a number of, of stories concerning that. I want to talk about something else for a minute, and that is the theory of evolution, because I know that all of you in our audience have heard about the Darwinianism, the Darwinian idea of natural selection uh, that it, it tends to develop a, an improved version of any species. You start out with a weaker uh, version mm -hmm. of a species, and through natural selection you end up with a stronger one. You apply that to humankind, and you infer that back, way back when, human beings were uh, stooped over kind of Neanderthal types, and, or they were smaller, they looked a little bit like apes, and over the years they, they got better and better and better and better until we are what we are today. And the only inference, uh, L.A., that can come from that is that humans are getting better all the time, and the next generation of humans will be better than us. Mm. But that's not what the Bible says, mm. as a matter of fact. The Bible really says almost the exact reverse. Mm. And, and we, again, we, we go to a biblical passage where we see that, that our genetics are changed right around the Tower of Babel. We go from living 500 to 900 years. All of a sudden, our DNA somehow has changed where we're brought down to about 120 years. Man shall live about 120 years. So we see that. And it, it, look, in my opinion, um, What's, what's happening or what has happened on the planet uh, through thousands of years has not been evolution. What we see is man is pretty much the same as he's always been, but we've get, we get these anomalies that, that are there, and when they surface and when archaeologists or whoever discover these artifacts, they are immediately trucked away, hidden from sight. We actually saw this in Peru. We went to one museum. We were supposed to see a collection of very elongated skulls. And the entire wing 
the entire room, I should say, which is a very large room, like 20 by 30, mm -hmm. the entire exhibit was gone. And it had been gone for months. Everything was boarded up. And we asked the, um, the docent there, it's like, well, when is the exhibit going to come back? And there were no plans for the immediate future to actually have that uh, exhibit brought back in. So even in farthest Peru, the uh, censorship is striking. And it's so starting you, to happen, yes. And, but the amazing, window's closing. But you got there, I, I, I think, just in time. I hope so. Just in time to write this book. And by the way, there is something that we need to introduce into, into this uh, uh, conversation. That is Genesis 6-4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. Now, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about the fact that these giants, the Nephilim, are not humans. Uh, if anything, they might be a human hybrid. Right. And they were absolutely in disfavor with the Lord and were destroyed, but reappeared. And again, they were in disfavor with the Lord. When the children of Israel came into the land, they were instructed of the Lord to wipe out the giants. Mm -hmm. There were giants, and they were not human as we think of humanity. Now, this affects, in my opinion, everything we know about human history. And it is this book, when you read this book and see not only the Nephilim skulls, but also the Nephilim architecture, which L.A. was able to photograph and present in a particular way, it's going to change the way you look at history. It's going to change the way you look at prophecy, Bible prophecy. And having said that, L.A., where do we go from here? Well, you know, Jesus says, and he, and he sort of admonishes us, give us a, it gives us a very clear warning. It'll be like the days of Noah when I return. I'm paraphrasing. It'll be like the days of Noah when the Son of Man returns, which immediately begs the question, what differentiates the days of Noah from any other time in history? And of course, it's the presence of the fallen angels coming down, having doing the unspeakable, having sex with the women, and creating this hybrid entity or being known as the Nephilim. In my opinion... This has happened all throughout history. The first incursion, of course, is Genesis 6. But then there's another incursion. We see the same penalty meted out to Sodom and Gomorrah. Wipe them all out. There's not a shred of grace and mercy with Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the same thing happen again when they push into the Levant, when Joshua and Caleb go into the Promised Land. The same idea. There's not a shred of grace and mercy yet, and this is also in the book, yet when, uh, when the Ninevites... Who, are, who probably invented the word barbarian, well, they're given a chance. And, and he sends, the Most High God sends Jonah the prophet in to preach to them, and they repent. So grace and mercy is extended to the Ninevites. How come not to the children of Israel, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah, and of course the Nephilim who were all over the world at the time of the flood? Now, you were able to make copies of, and we have it on the table, a, a replica of a skull which is not a human skull. I have to say that. Um, and there's so much we could say, and we have so little time, but what about this artifact in front of us changes the way we should look at the world? Well, first of all, people need to understand that we, uh, when we went to Peru, these, uh, these skulls were found in private museums. Again, the window, the window of opportunity to see these is, is, is rapidly closing. But there are collections that are, that are able to be seen in private museums. Um, and we photographed literally hundreds of them. We saw hundreds of them. It's not just one, uh, one skull that we looked at. And this, we believe, is a female. And it's, it's, not, a, it's not like a really large skull. I mean, you can see it next to, next to my head. It, it's not a very large being, probably less than six feet tall. We believe it's a female. But what, what brought our attention to it, and by the way, this is the work of Joe Taylor, Mount Blanco Museum, the casting is just incredible. You'll notice, and, and, and let me back up here. Some people will say immediately that it's cradle headboarding. Cradle headboarding is when they would take an infant and, and fasten a board here and a board in the back and then bind the head. And as the infant grew, of course, it would shape the skull. But there are anomalies in the skull. We've had three medical doctors look at them. Also, a forensic anthropologist examined this particular skull. And a normal skull has four plates, a frontal plate, there should be a parietal suture which splits this plate here, but you, as you see, there is not one. But there should be two parietal plates, and of course, the plate in the rear, the occipital plate. 
what we see here is a frontal plate with a very pronounced ridge right in this area, which should not be there. And then, of course, when we get to the top of the skull, where there should be two parietal plates, we don't see a hint, not even a hint of a suture. Um, again, medical doctors have looked at this. The nasal cavity is all wrong. The eyes seem to be enlarged. Uh, it seems to be missing teeth um, in the skull, which should be there and are not there. So there's a lot of anomalous features with the skull. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is, is the male skull was about like this, out to, out to my hand, much more robust. This here is called the zygomatic arch, this bone here. And on, in the male skulls, it was much more pronounced. The, the lower jaw, the mandible, very, very uh, robust looking. Same thing with the upper jaw, the maxilla. Completely different. If, if you saw this, um, the skull, and we've got pictures of that in the book, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. And of many other skulls, too. Yes. Some of them are quite giant, but all with this elongated, elongated skull. cranium. Yes, elongated skull. And the practice of headboarding, why would anyone do that? to try to reshape a human skull. Maybe they were trying to imitate the look of these creatures. This is what I think, and, and other researchers have looked into this and, and postulate that they are emulating um, an entity. This shape is desirable because whoever had this shape, I believe, had certain um, supernatural powers. If, if this skull is representative of a Nephilim skull, then we are looking at a hybrid creature who is demonically enhanced. In other words, they may look partially human, mm -hmm. but they're, it's a mixture of angelic with human. Remember, no one would go up against Goliath. He was a big guy, but there may have been other issues with Goliath. I believe, of course, Goliath was Nephilim. So no one would go up against him of, right. uh, but, but David. There's something going on in the story. These beings are charged demonically. They have superpowers. So this is why, if, this is why other cultures all around the world are emulating this shape, mimicking this shape, because it, it, it hails back to the original ones. Now, there were different species of giants in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Some are called the Zuzim, uh, some are called the Anakim, mm -hmm. some called the Zamzumim, right. all these strange names in Hebrew. They all have very interesting uh, etymologies, you mm -hmm. know. The noisy ones, the troublemakers. The long necks. The long necked ones, the Anakim. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's very clear that the Bible is telling us there were non-humans in Israel at the time when Joshua brought the children of Israel into the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. Now, that time would roughly correspond to the time of these skulls that you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, the, the, uh, the conquest of the Holy Land is about 3,500 years ago, and this Paracas culture on the west coast of Peru shows up right around that time, out of nowhere. And, wow. and they, we also believe that one of the features that these particular people had in Paracas or whatever they were, hybrid beings, they have red hair. And we know that no Native American tribe has reddish auburn hair. And By the we way, actually tested the hair. In the book, you can see a picture of a skull that still has red hair on yes. it. Uh, some of the hair is missing, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the hair has been tested. It's not dyed hair, right? It's not dyed hair. Wow. Yeah. Okay, what should we come to? Uh, there's something else about the place you visited, and this is very important, <clears throat> the ancient architecture of these creatures who were non-human, and it, it, I almost hesitate to say it, but I have to say it, they were non-human. Mm -hmm. They were other than human. I agree. And they I built agree. remarkable, remarkable buildings that could not be duplicated today. Now. Wait a minute, not with all our engineering, our huge industrial equipment, our laser cutters. Couldn't do it today, right? There were places that we saw, one in particular, Sakse Waman, where huge megalithic, megalithic means very large stone, stoneworks, huge megalithic structures uh, were put in place. And when you're there and you actually look at these, and we have, by the way, there's like a centerfold of Sakse Waman in the book full color. It's, it's, it's just an amazing place. When you're actually there standing in front of the wall, um, it is just mind-blowing to think that a culture, let's say the Inca, who, you know, archaeologists will tell us the Inca built this stuff, and it, there's just no way, in my opinion, uh, the Inca who didn't have the wheel somehow transported blocks of stone, megalithic blocks of stone, weighing up to in an excess of 120 tons each 
from 40 to 60 miles away, 2,000 feet below the 12,000 foot site level. Now, how does the culture do that? And not only that, when they got the stones there, they then began to shape them into polygonal shapes. There's not one stone which mimics another. It's like if you were building in modernity, you know, you would have stones and you dress them all pretty much the same, make a nice tight little mortar fit. None of the stones are, are, are duplicates. None of the stones are jointed together with any type of mortar that we see. And yet these cuts, if there's a shape of a stone, let's say, let's say here's one angle, here's the top of the angle. This goes all the way through the stone. These angles go all the way through. They're not just dressed in the front and then they, you know, kind of go off. They're perfectly constructed and they're polished surfaces. So these are not temples. These structures, we believe, were part of some sort of an ancient grid which literally covered the planet. Sacsayhuaman, for instance, I believe, is pre-flood, just like the Giza Pyramid, pre-flood. Mm -hmm. Other structures are post-flood, and we indicate that in the book. But Sacsayhuaman was one of, one of those places where you just stand there and you go, oh my gosh, there's really, Gary, there's, there's, there's two schools of thought here. And this is like sort of a rebuttal on the History Channel's, all due respect, Ancient Aliens program. It's either we're looking at ET technology, beings from other worlds which come here, which, is, which a History Channel has been promulgating, which of course we don't believe in, or this is Nephilim architecture. In other words, what we're seeing is the supernatural, the supernatural beings known as fallen angels manifesting openly on the planet. And because angels have different physical characteristics than we do and are able to manipulate time, space, and matter, as we see with Peter when the angel comes in his jail cell, uh, everyone is switched off, the chains fall off Peter, the door cell opens, the guards are all asleep, out he walks. The angel is manipulating time, space, and matter in ways that defy our physics. Well, I believe that these, these sites are what I would call Nephilim architecture, but go back, trace back to the fallen ones. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, you either believe that or you don't. Yeah. And if you begin to fully develop what the days of Noah were like, and believe me, they were different than our day, yet the Bible says that's all going to happen again. That is to say, there will be other than human beings walking the face of the earth, just as they did before. I think you're building a remarkable case here for uh, those who may be here at the time when this happens again. What people need to understand, in my opinion, is that the fallen one has been trying to create man in his own image. That's the end game here. He's trying to create man in his own image, and he tries over and over and over again. Every time he does this, the mandate from our loving, good, benevolent father is to wipe them all out. So it's either we're looking at a hybrid in, in Genesis, which is the Nephilim, Sodom and Gomorrah, what's happening in, in the promised mm -hmm. land, or there's something else to play. Or we do serve, in fact, sort of a genocidal, homicidal, maniacal God who's very capricious and favors one tribe over another. But as I said earlier, there's grace and mercy extended to the Ninevites. Anytime a Nephilim are there, the judgment is severe, it's final, and it's, it's just wiped them all out. Why? Because we're looking at a fallen angel, human, coming together, creating a hybrid which is never supposed to be there. Now... We have a statement, for example, in Isaiah chapter 26, where Isaiah says, they are dead, mm -hmm. they shall not rise. And he's talking about the general resurrection when the Lord comes. And of this group, Isaiah says, they are dead. And the, the word that's translated dead is Rephaim, Rephaim, which is translated in the rest of the Old Testament as giants. Mm -hmm. Yes. They are giants, they shall not rise. In other words, they will not see resurrection. Mm -hmm. Why? because they are not human. That is to say, they are not covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not, if you will, eligible for resurrection. I agree. This is an astonishing story that, that you won't hear in church. <laughs> 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 it's amazing to me that we're sitting here talking about this and some may be tempted to criticize and say, wait a minute, what's the good of telling the world about, even if this were true, why should we even want to know about it and deal with that question, if you will? Well, 
again, we're the church. We believe in the virgin birth, floating axes, talking donkeys, two gold coins that appear out of fish's mouth, staffs that turn into serpents, uh, waters mm -hmm. that stand up on a heap, men that walk on water, others that rise from the dead, a couple of the fish turn into feet. Five. I mean, do we realize how absolutely nuts so that stuff is? Go down and tell your psychiatrist you just spoke to your horse and he was telling you some stuff. See how far you get. Yeah. I mean, we believe in the supernatural. Jesus is pointing to the one of the times in history when he says it'll be like the days of Noah that is, is screaming at us out of all the places in the Tanakh that he could point to. He points back to Genesis. And there's a reason for it because it's a seed war that's happening with these fallen beings. Satan is outnumbered two to one. If these are the end times, and I think both of us believe that they are, the fallen one is trying desperately to bolster his forces. He knows his time is growing short. And I believe this ties back into the abduction phenomena with the whole UFO thing, which we've talked about before. Right. This is a real phenomena. The bottom line is Satan is attempting to create man in his own image. And we think from our other research, and we'll talk about this, that he's very close to doing it. Well, let me tell you about the book. It's called On the Trail of the Nephilim. And this book is beautifully constructed. Now, it's larger than the average paperback book because it has uh, just page after page, and we'll show you uh, some of these as I speak, of gorgeously reproduced photographs. Uh, of L.A.'s travels, of uh, a number of skulls of, of these, if you will, Nephilim. You need to know about this because what it does is validate the Word of God, mm -hmm. the Bible. It makes the Bible stand strong, and particularly when we're talking about the subject of evolution. You know, back in the mid-19th century, uh, Darwin, Lamarck, and others uh, solidified this theory of evolution. It's basically, may I say it, it's a lie. This exposes the lie, at least in part. It's stage one, I think. It's the shot across the bow of <laughs> secular science. I've We're on the trail, Gary. Oh, listen. We're on, on the, the trail. On the trail of the Nephilim, to be exact. The Nephilim, you say? Have you people lost your minds? No. It's in the Bible, my friend. The word Nephilim is in the Bible. It means the ones who fell, mm -hmm. the fallen ones. Mm -hmm. the, the whole Bible is about the story of man's fall, about fallen angels. It's about the redemption of man. It's about angels in competition with the whole redemptive process. It's a huge story, and you've just added a nice little block to that story. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You've outdone yourself. This is a graphically magnificent book. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, we were talking about the Nephilim. We we're talking about your trip to Peru mm -hmm. in which you documented, you believe, the existence of a prior civilization of giants as described in the Bible. Uh, we either believe that or not. Where do we go from here? Well, it, it's interesting that it, it goes back to um, the idea that fallen angels are coming to earth having sex with the women, and creating this uh, abomination in God's sight known as the Nephilim. When Joshua and Caleb come in, and this is like, in my opinion, perhaps three or four incursions down the line from what we see in Genesis, the Nephilim tribes are there. They are listed in Numbers and, and, and other places in the Bible referred back to. They are, they are listed, the Zanzamim, the Emims, the Rephites, the, Nep uh, the Nephilim, uh, the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, all these tribes are Nephilim tribes, and they may have different genetic characteristics. What's interesting is if they do have different genetic characteristics, why is that so? In my opinion, the fallen one, Satan, is attempting to create man in his own image, and he's always messing with the gene pool, always messing around with it, trying to find the, whatever the combination he needs to create this fallen angel, human, which then becomes a demonic hybrid known as the Nephilim. When Joshua and Caleb come in, the mandate is, is very clear and very severe. Without a hint of grace and mercy, wipe them all out. Men, women, children, cattle, burn everything. Destroy everything. Now, how do we, you know, a lot of people look at that, Gary, and, and say to themselves, well, that's not the loving God. And unless we plug in the Nephilim, it, it's genocide. I mean, there's no way around it. 
Unless we plug him in Nephilim, we serve a genocidal, maniacal, crazy God who's capricious and, and favors one tribe of people over another. But then we've got the proof text of the Ninevites who God sends Jonah to, you know, to them in order that they would repent. And of course they do. And these guys invented the word barbarian. For instance, if you went to Nineveh on the weekend, bad, bad choice, you would see a row of stakes around the city with heads on a stake. This is how these people live. Flayed human flesh up on the walls. I mean, they were literally barbaric. Yet, grace and mercy is extended to the Ninevites. We don't see that at all when the Nephilim are present. We see judgment. As a matter of fact, and we mentioned this on our last broadcast with L.A., but I want to read Isaiah 26, 14, because it, it perfectly illustrates what you're talking about. It says, they are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Mm. Now, this is Isaiah 26, 14. He's talking about the Rephaim, yes. which is another word for the Nephilim. Mm -hmm. The uh, Rephaim would be the, uh, the restored, if you will, antediluvian race that came back after the flood. But judgment is pronounced on them. It says they are dead and they shall not rise. That is, they'll never experience resurrection. That says a mouthful, and it, it really backs up what you're saying. Well, it does. And again, any time a Nephilim are present, the judgment is severe. What's interesting is when we move over into the book of Revelation, uh, we see the same type of judgment. Anyone who takes the mark of the beast, they wind up in the lake of fire. There's not a hint of grace and mercy. And there's a reason for this. This mark, in my opinion, we've talked about this before, but this mark may have more to it than any of us have ever thought before. I believe that if a person takes this mark, it will literally change their DNA, change their DNA, and they will become a modern-day Nephilim. In other words, they become the seed of the fallen one, the seed of Satan. And that's why we see the same judgment meted out to those who take the mark of the beast as we do in the book of Genesis. You take this mark, you be, your, your DNA is altered, like the skull here. Your DNA is altered. You become some sort of a hybrid. That's why the judgment, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, technology today is capable of DNA modification. Sure. And people are very, very worried that uh, the result will be some sort of non-human. But if you magnify that or take that to the next level, let's say the next generation of DNA modification, combined with the fact that there are uh, demonic intrusions that are modifying DNA in human beings even mm -hmm. as we speak, and of course you've documented that in some of your other work. Sure. Then we have exactly what's described in the Bible, a situation in which the days of Noah are repeated. That is, these, uh, if you will, human alien hybrids will once again walk the earth. They are not uh, eligible, if you will, for redemption. They must be destroyed, even as in the days of Noah. Noah and his family were saved. Why? Because they were genetically perfect, and they became the parents of the three uh, branches of the human race, mm -hmm. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Mm -hmm. and, and humanity in its pure form started all over again. That's right. Now we have not just the Bible story, we have history. We have locations that, that are scouted and photographed and reproduced for you in this book on the trail of the Nephilim. And I want, to, I want you to know that I think you have literally changed the paradigm by which we all uh, grew up and gained our basic information about life. We learned one thing, now we're learning something entirely different. And, and thank you for that. I, that's, um, that's probably way too big of a title for me to, to, to put on. But the bottom line is this. What we believe is that there was a race uh, that predated Native Americans. We see them in North America. We also see them in South America. And, and the reason for this, we've got evidence. And we had to go to Peru to get that evidence. And of course, this, we believe, um, is a Nephilim skull. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, we don't have DNA testing, but we've tested the hair from some of the skulls, which was very interesting. It, now, this leads me to believe that there is genetic manipulation occurring some 3,000 to 3,500 years ago. Now, uh, the critic might say, well, this is a skull that was bound from birth, that it was a right. cr cradle, cradle, headboarding. Board, cradle headboarding, or maybe it had 
some sort of ribbon wrapped around mm -hmm. to apply pressure to, sh mm -hmm. to reshape it. But people who really know their business have looked at this skull and said, wait a minute, this is entirely anomalous, including the number of uh, molars. Yeah, the, uh, the teeth apparently are, are missing. There's, there's not space enough uh, in, in the upper jaw, um, the maxilla, to uh, hold all the teeth that should be there. Uh, while we were down there, we saw many uh, different anomalous, not only skulls, but skeletons. I mean, it was absolutely mind-blowing. And the reason for this is there are these little private museums tucked away in far-off places, uh, remote villages. One, for instance, was uh, Waitara at about 9,000 feet above sea level, a three-hour drive from Paracas, which is on the coast of Peru, into the highlands of the Andes. And we, we arrived there and saw this, this skeleton, which just was absolutely mind-blowing. The head was almost as large as the torso. A little later on, we went to another place, and we saw what was a skeleton known as Waki. That's the nickname. And again, very elongated skull. The fontanelle, which should have been closed, was wide open. Yet this being had molars. It had two really weird indentations in the lower jaw. It was also missing two ribs. So again, it points, in my opinion, you say, well, what's going on here? I believe that what we're looking at is the handiwork of the fallen one. In other words, he is, he is exercising some sort of genetic manipulation to create man in his own image, which is really the end game here. And this is why it's so important to understand when Jesus tells us it'll be like the days of Noah when he returns, this is what he's pointing to. It happened in antiquity, and I believe it's happening in modernity. Now, the, the other side of this story is the architectural side, which is, by the way, very thoroughly covered in, in uh, L.A.'s book. There is architecture in existence today which you believe is antediluvian, that is, before the flood of Noah. <clears throat> and it's architecture of such a nature that it couldn't be repeated with our present technology today. It's mind-blowing when you start to look at it. In fact, the first thing I said to L.A. when I saw him was, well, have you figured out how they put all those stones together? <laughs> and he said, no, I haven't. In fact, I can't imagine how they put all those stones together because you have here gorgeous, huge megaliths that are odd-shaped. They're not just rectangular blocks, but they are curvilinear. Some of them have little notches, and they all fit perfectly. perfectly. You couldn't do that. If you tried today, you might be able to do it, but it would take you 20 or 30 years per stone, I think. How do we put all this together? Well, again, we're looking at, if, if the Bible is true, and see, as Christians, we need to understand that we live in this supernatural universe. You know, we, we go to church every Sunday and we talk about virgin birth, floating axes, talking donkeys, men that get swallowed up by whales, get spit out three days later, staffs that turn into serpents, two gold coins which are found in fish's mouth. I mean, this stuff is all supernatural. Well, where does, it, where does the supernatural end? The, it doesn't close in the apostolic age. What we see is the supernatural is manifesting more than it ever has before. When we get into the book of Revelation, what comes out of the, ab 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 out of the abyss? these bizarre looking creatures. So with that in mind, when we go to places like Sacsayhuaman, which is uh, in Cusco, about 12,000 feet above sea level, what we see are these, are these huge megalithic stones forming sort of a zigzag shaped wall in the middle of nowhere at about 12,000 feet above sea level. The quarry is 40 to 60 miles away. Some of these stones, they range between the smaller ones at 20 tons, the larger ones at plus 120 tons. Mm -hmm. And it begs the question, how does a culture which doesn't have the wheel transport these things? <laughs> and you can't do it in antiquity. There's no way. And then once they're there, how do you shape them into polygonal shapes, which, by the way, go all the way through the surface of the stone? They're just not on the exterior. All these cuts go all the way through the stone and stack them without water and without any space between them. You can't put a human hair between them. And the people who live there have built upon these ruins so that you can actually right. view yes. the, the progression, or should I say the digression. Because it is a digression. I, indeed. Yeah. The, the yes, earlier absolutely. architecture is superior Far to superior. that which comes later. Far superior. And, and again, in my opinion, the, we have two, two theories here. One, extraterrestrials did it. You can turn on the Ancient Aliens series and 
watch all about ancient astronauts, which we don't believe in, or we're looking at the handiwork of the fallen angels right. and, and their progeny known as the Nephilim. And of course, that's the paradigm we're holding to. That's what the book is about. That's what Watchers 6 is about. Everything is pointing. And the evidence that we saw, Gary, is, is amazing because the evidence seems to point so far, it's lining up very well, to when Joshua and Caleb pushed into the Promised Land, there was a diaspora. These, these giants and races of Nephilim tribes fled the Levant or, or the Promised Land. Some went northward, some went across the Atlantic, and we believe settled in Peru, specifically mm. in Paracas. And perhaps they had a way to walk across back in those days because, you know, the land bridge hypothesis sure. is, is intact and, and maybe they traveled across. We don't know, but we do know they existed. Let's talk for a moment now <clears throat> about some gigantic architecture in North America. You've recently well, done some conferences in yes. that area. There are giant artifacts in America and they have characteristics that are way beyond what we might think of as mm -hmm. ancient. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites is the, uh, the henge, and a henge is a circle uh, of stonework, and this is megalithic stonework found in New Hampshire. It's called American Stonehenge. And in the book, I interviewed Kelsey Stone and his father um, about this, this site. His grandfather actually bought the site, and they, the family, the Stone family, no pun intended, has been like curators in protecting the site um, for now a number of decades. Well, we know that a henge usually is astronomical and sometimes you know, lunar and astronomical sightings, specifically summer and winter solstices, fall and spring equinoxes. So Kelsey Stone's sitting at the computer on Google Earth, and he's, he's deciding to, yeah, I wonder what, if, what it would be like if I took a, a line on Google Earth and extended it from the center of America's Stonehenge, which is in New Hampshire, and just ran with that line and see where it went. And what he did is he, he looked at the at this, let's say, well, this, we got some props here. Uh, let's say this is America's Stonehenge. And so he drew a line out to the standing stone, which uh, is placed where the summer sunrise, on the longest day of the year, summer solstice, comes up over that. And he extended it and extended it and extended it and just kept going in a straight line. And to his absolute utter astonishment, and of course mine when I got this information, is it bisected the trilithon, which is three standing stones, in Stonehenge, England. Gary, you can't do that in antiquity. That's not a coincidence, and it gets better. When he extended the line from Amer Amer the American Stonehenge here in New Hampshire through the, uh, the center trilithon in Stonehenge, England, when he extended that line further, he eventually wound up in Beirut, Lebanon. And you say to yourself, what's so special about Beirut, Lebanon? Everything. Beirut, Lebanon is the home of the seafaring people known as the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians are the direct descendants of the Canaanites, and the Canaanites were a Nephilim tribe. And get this, there's absolutely no way to line this stuff up in antiquity. I've spoken to a surveyor. The only way you can do it is from the air. And this, of course, goes back to the fallen one, one of his titles, the prince of the power of the air. Here we have direct evidence, in my opinion, direct evidence that traces back to the biblical Nephilim and shows us that they were creating this grid, this, these cultures, that they were creating architecture, not only in the Middle East, as we've come to believe, but globally. Now, may I suggest that you read the book because the diagram in the book is a lot better than, than LA's <laughs> tabletop props. And you'll be able to see how the, these lines were deduced and, and, and drawn and scaled out. Let's talk for a minute about the fact that you have to be above these things yes. looking down to really appreciate them. Some of the, uh, tell me about some of the large structures in North, the northeastern United States. Well, in, in, in North America, specifically in Ohio, there's a place called the Ohio Mounds. And this is a very large circular henge. And again, a henge is a, is a, is a circle, but in, in the center of this one or in, inside, there's a waterway. And whoever built this, uh, the, the river source is about a mile away and there was some sort of an underground aqueduct system, which when whoever was using this, and by the way, they've, they've dated this around 3,000 to 4,000 years old, about 3,500 years old, let's say, just round it off, which again fits our model of Joshua and Caleb coming into the promised land. There's a diaspora. The giants move northward through Europe, come down and settle in the Ohio Valley. Others build boats, and Thor Heyerdahl proved this with Kantiki and Ra, 
those books written decades ago, that you could sail from Egypt and wind up in South America. I mean, he proved that. So what we believe is that this is Nephilim architecture, that the fallen one continues to set up or attempting to set up the same grid system that he once had in the antediluvian world before the flood. And this, these structures, specifically the Great Circle Mound, which is connected to another edifice called the Octagon Mound, when you're in them, well, you can so sort of see what's going on. But when you're in the air, that's when the complex takes shape. And we realize that these structures were meant to be seen from the air. How would you do that? You have to be able to get airborne somehow. Well, if you're a fallen angel. <laughs> We're talking about things that are not uh, pipe dreams. They are not some romanticized version of what someone would like to think is true. We're talking about uh, putting together mysteries that have been written in the Bible now for thousands of years but have lain dormant until this time. I think the time has come to reveal these things because of that single verse that we keep repeating uh, uh, about the days mm -hmm. of Noah. Mm -hmm. and, and as it was in the days of Noah, so, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus clearly spoke those words. And when he did, he knew all about what we're talking. He knew far more than, Absolutely. than what we're talking about. We, we're just barely scratching the surface of an ancient mystery, but the book on the trail of the Nephilim uh, will take you into places, believe me, you wouldn't want to hike there unless you're in very, very good shape. And, and uh, you, you took a crew and you were exhausted, right? Yeah, we were, we were down in Peru for like two weeks and the artifacts and, the, and we were able to handle them, Gary. I mean, for us, this, is, this, is, this skull, again, was cast by Joe Taylor, but to walk into a small private museum and seeing 40 of these skulls and the doors open and which one you gentlemen want to look at? Well, how about all of them? Okay. And we were able to handle and weigh and look at these things. Uh, we're going to go back at some point and take better DNA samples. We took a sample of the red hair. Uh, what, the results from that was astonishing. That's also in Watcher 6, absolutely astonishing. What we discovered uh, through a process called Raman spectroscopy. Um, look, something's going on. And it's been deliberately obfuscated because Darwinism is the paradigm which has been permeated, not only academia, but the scientific community. Darwinism is what we're taught in the schools. It's, it's all about Darwin. Even down in South America, they had that same stupid little illustration that we've always seen, some knuckle-dragging half-man chimpanzee, and slowly, magically, just becomes a human being a modern human being. It's just a, it's the biggest bunch of hooey, in my opinion, if I can use that word, that's ever come down the pike. And what Christians need to understand is that there has been a deliberate obfuscation of evidence that would point away from a Darwinian theory, and that's what's in On the Trail of a Nephilim. When we talk about uh, those papers, newspaper articles found uh, as, as settlers are moving in, in the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, they are uncovering 9, 10, 11 footers with large uh, double rows of teeth, larger skeletons, six fingers, six toes. All of this points back to Nephilim tribes found in the Bible. And it slams, it goes up against the Darwinian paradigm. The Darwinian paradigm, the, uh, the one that's being taught in all the schools all over the world. They all have the diagrams on the schoolroom wall. Yep, they're everywhere. The knuckle dragger becomes modern man. Modern man, in, a, in essence, creates himself out of whole cloth. He does not need a God because he's doing a pretty good job on his own. It's a lie. And I think what uh, L.A. is doing is going to at least make a crack in that giant edifice that has insinuated itself into the halls of learning all over the world. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I should pause at this point and, uh, and let you know that uh, we'd like to offer you uh, L.A.'s latest uh, effort and by the way it's definitely worth the read it, it it fills in a blank in scripture that you might not have understood the sixth chapter of genesis introduces us to a controversial subject sure to capture your attention and pique your curiosity the bible speaks of a heavenly rebellion from the ancient past 
led by the fallen angel Lucifer, who convinced a group of angels to leave their heavenly home and come to earth, where they took human wives who bore children to them. Our English Bibles call their offspring giants, but the original Hebrew words called them fallen ones or Nephilim. These rebellious angels committed an unforgivable sin against humanity, men and women made in the image of God. Their purpose was simple, corrupt the seed of the Messiah and prevent his birth. But God had a counter move. Judgment would soon follow with the flood of Noah, which destroyed all life on the planet with the exception of Noah and his family. Yet after the flood, we see the Nephilim on earth once again. Why would God allow this to happen? LA's new counter move book answers this question and it's available for your gift of $25 or more to Prophecy Watchers. Just call the toll free number on your screen 24 seven and we'll get LA's new counter move book on its way to you along with a free bonus DVD for supporting the work of Prophecy Watchers. We also put together the Footprints of the Nephilim package, which includes LA's 600 page classic work on the Trail of the Nephilim, a second book that describes the ancient battle between Jesus and Lucifer, the cosmic chess match, and his new counter move book. All three books can be yours for your gift of $85 or more to help us continue the mission of Prophecy Watchers. And as always, shipping is included anywhere in the USA. When you choose the Footprints of the Nephilim package, we'll include two bonus DVDs from Gary Stearman, perhaps the best research ever done on this subject. Footprints of the Nephilim and It's All About the Seed are two hour-long conference presentations that will shed new light on this ancient rebellion and how God plans Satan's demise far in advance. Just call the toll-free number on your screen or visit our online bookstore at prophecywatchers.tv to take advantage of these exciting offers. Your support enables Prophecy Watchers to continue our mission to correctly and clearly expound Bible prophecy and exalt the gospel of grace, bringing hope and comfort in these last days. Until next time, God bless you and keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. The book is called On the Trail of the Nephilim. If there was one thing that you would call attention to in this book, what would it be? What's, what's to you is the most exciting aspect of On the Trail of the Nephilim? Well, I, I think for me is that the words of the Bible are totally true and that everything that was written down there, which may seem like, well, you know, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't, really did happen. I'm a biblical literalist. And when, you know, when you're down in Peru and you're actually holding the original skull, which by the way is between 3,000 and 3,500 years old, which fits the timeline, and, and you look at that and you see, you say to yourself, oh my gosh, there's no parietal suture here. And, and you look at some of the male skeletons, which are like this. Again, only one parietal plate. You just sit there and going, it's true. The Nephilim were there, and also afterwards, when the sons of God, the fallen angels, had sex with the women. And remember, Jesus alludes to us. He's pointing to us to be aware, to be on the lookout of the same type of thing happening again. It was mind-blowing, Gary, absolutely mind-blowing. You know, eschatologically speaking, <clears throat> we think that these are the days of, of the, our Lord's coming. There are just too many things coming together right mm -hmm. now. The Middle East... Uh, the, the great economic uh, contest and subsequent collapses which are bound to occur, China, the European theater, the United States, all of this was, was prophesied by Jesus. Earthquakes. Here we are. Just, and here we are. Now if you add this to it, if you add the evidence of a non-human civilization that once populated the earth and built superior artifacts that were still in existence today, that's the final piece of the puzzle. I, I love what you've done here. And, and as I say, uh, L.A. has totally outdone everything that has gone before. I think the Lord's raised him up for this day. And uh, what do you think? Are we close to the day spoken of in Scripture? I hope so. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> so do I. In fact, we really believe that. Our Lord is at the door. 
That's why we always close each one of these uh, programs by saying, we're watching. Why don't you keep watching too?